Hello, Sean. Hello. This is uh, welcome to the BTS Creative Academy podcast. Uh, we're currently streaming live over YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, on this episode, I'm talking to Sean Hayden, who is the host of the Stage Combat podcast. Um, Sean, how are you? You're in New York. I'm great, Martin, in the UK. How are you? Yeah, doing good. It's uh, I always find this amazing that we can connect like this, isn't it? Like you, you forget know, how amazing it is because we're yeah, but it is we, yeah. We we should be we should be used to it, but here I am in the UK in my shed, <laughs> <laughs> talking to and, you in New, New York, and, I, and I'm sitting right outside construction in Manhattan. So who knows what we'll hear? Yes, yeah, exactly, and uh, yeah, that's the the excitement of going live that we'll. Um, We'll just see. We'll just see what yeah. happens. But I'm I'm very excited to talk to you. I'm a I'm a big fan of your podcast. Um, Thank you. I, I we was, have a lot was, of UK listeners. It's great. Well, I was I was introduced by a friend of mine who yeah. actually she's been a I think she's been a part of your podcast. Uh, uh, our friend Luna. Luna. Luna yeah, Austin. and she we have a we have a um, a series on our Instagram feed called Dear Stage Combat where performing artists kind of share their thoughts of what's happened to them or what they want to see done better in the industry or something about mental health. And Luna gave a very popular um, uh, Deer Stage Combat. And I think that's how we sort of all connected, right? It was. Well, you say that there was something weird happened that I just contacted you anyway. And Is then, that right? Yeah. It like, had nothing well, to do with Luna. It had nothing to do with Luna. Oh, that's great. And yeah. then you contacted me, and then you yeah. put something out about Luna on the same day. Oh, I see. And it, there was this weird, there's like... There's an energy there. There's a synergy, too. Yeah, I was like, there yeah. was this weird little triangle thing going on. I, I then, like, phoned Luna, and I was like, did you speak to him about me at all? And he's like, no. And just all in, like, this space of an hour, Yeah. just all three of us were communicating, and we had yeah. no idea that we were talking to each other. And yeah. Well, like I say, sometimes there's a weird set synergy, and yeah, I think and, so. And things sometimes are meant to to connect, aren't they? Yeah, think, yeah, that's cool. And I really enjoyed connecting with her and all the artists in the UK that we've connected with on Stage Combat. So, so your podcast is a different format to to what I'm doing. I'm I'm speaking to guests that are doing something creative. But your podcast gives me this feel of like a, a true crime documentary, kind of dramatized. Um, you talk for events and it it sounds really, uh, yeah, it almost sounds like a drama that, yeah. that I'm listening to. It doesn't sound like uh, real life stories. And it's re it really does pull you in. Yeah. Well, that was the concept for the first two seasons. So seasons one and two are different than what's coming up in this new season that comes out in July. Um, you know, the idea was uh, I suffered a mental health crisis while working at one of the most powerful theaters over here in the U.S. on the Eastern Seaboard. And, um, you know, it's something a lot of people can relate to. I didn't feel safe in my job and there were repercussions for speaking out. And that whole event really has put me down a three and a half year mental health journey. So the idea was how can we tell this story, but tell it like it's a true crime podcast? And so we told it with lots of production and voice actors and music. Music's very important. And that's what the first two seasons were. And then in this third season, because we had so many people respond to the story, you know, I this happened to me at this theater and this I didn't feel safe in this situation. So we're telling the stories of those listeners in this third season, but we're doing it in a highly produced way, not like a true crime podcast. It's, I would say it's more like over here, we call it national public radio. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know what the equivalent would be. Is it channel? I don't yeah, like the channel. channel yeah, BBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah BBC. Or yeah. Channel, or do like a documentary kind of. Yeah. Series. But still the storytelling aspect that you heard in my personal story, that's very much the way we approach our listener stories with me as the narrator who went through this thing. So I have a perspective, you know, I'm coming with the lived history and these stories really affect me, you know, as the narrator. And so how can we tell these stories? How can, and we highlight a different issue each episode, but it's always about the storytelling. I've always thought there's power 
in our stories. There's power in storytelling, right? We feel validated, we feel heard, we feel seen. Mm. And that's always what's at the essence of stage combat. Yeah, this I feel this storytelling is in a, a new era at the moment with podcasts. Yeah. It's, Storytelling's taking on a taking on a new life form, isn't it? It's uh... yeah, it, it's great to have two people talking at a microphone. But you know what interests me is how can I bring real people in this new season and do it through storytelling, and perhaps make you think about things in a different way. Mm. So when you when you started doing this, why did you decide to do it in the format that you're doing it in? Why did you choose that that dramatization type format to to express this story? Well, the story of stage combat, my story of, of the particular theater, you know, when you boil it down to it, it's an HR story, <laughs> right? It's an HR nightmare. Human resources is what we call it over here. I don't know if it's yes, the same yeah. thing. And yeah. so the idea was, I just heard it in my head that way. How can I tell this in an interesting way that will bring you in? And then the true crime aspect sort of involuntarily happened that way. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I had been listening to a lot of true crime. Uh, you know, this Joe versus Carol, did you guys listen to about the Tiger King? Oh, of and course. The, yeah, the yeah, Tiger King yeah. massive. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, the events of stage combat happened just before the pandemic. It was, um, it was the summer into the fall of 2019. And so, you know, after and I was going through my own thing as a result of what happened at this theater, that I was watching <laughs> the Tiger King, and and I think that all sort of had an influence on me. It's like, hmm, there's an interesting way to tell a story, but I also wanted to really immerse people. I wanted people to know, because when a mental health crisis happens, you know, people would say things like, "Oh, I didn't think that would happen to someone like you." Like, what does that mean? And then I thought, well, let me let me immerse you in it. Let me tell you what it felt like in my brain. What it felt like in my mind, you know, her, particularly as a, you know, um, a male presenting person where we don't expect there, there's a stigma within the stigma. And I just wanted to be very open and just take people and let you know exactly what I experienced, even when my own employer refused to acknowledge what was happening, despite what I told them. But mm. let me let you experience it and maybe you'll see yourself in my story or someone that you know. What a what a wonderful way to express how you felt at that time than through drama, than through art, yeah, than through creativity. What a yeah. way to express it. Because like you said at the beginning there, this was a this was a HR type scenario, which is you know quite factual. And if you put it down on paper, all the the points, it could be a little bit boring and no one's gonna yeah. really engage with that. But by turning it into a drama. By adding that music, by adding that little bit of emotion to it, it engages people and it makes people think in a different way, doesn't it? Yeah. And look, it's a backstage story. So that's theatrical in itself. It was a production mm. of Billy Elliot set in the UK, right? <laughs> I mean, it was, I was playing Billy's dad. Uh, so, and then, you know, the backstage intrigue and, you know, you have the producer, the, the co-worker, the the director, and they all had their different motivations. It's almost like you could do an Agatha Christie out of it. You know, thank God no one got murdered. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, I mean, all the motivations were sort of there, and we sort of approached it from the storytelling. But honestly, this is just what happened. And then the other, you know, strange angle on this, Martin, is I'm also a lawyer. So I've always had two careers as an actor, as a lawyer. So that sort of fact-finding ability and to put evidence together and tell a story that was, you know, really key to putting it all together in a way that it came mm. out. They're two, they're two interesting careers to come together, a lawyer and an actor. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's what everyone says. I've never known anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, and there are, there are two worlds that don't really live together. The, if you're in the acting world, they don't understand why you're a lawyer. If you're in the lawyer world, they don't understand why you're an actor. You know? and I, to the point where I just don't care. You know, it's just what I do. No. Um, but it makes me who I am. And I think that's really reflected in those first two seasons of the podcast. But also in the third season, again, it's that sort of um, it's that storytelling and, and, and how do we tell the essence of, of what 
the stories are of these performing artists, but also the active part of me is what's the emotion? What do you feel? And do you see yourself in those stories? So does that side of you that's the lawyer, does that help with the, the writing or does that help you keep it factual and stop it from going off into dangerous territory where you're going to start naming names and and you become the the, the center of a lawsuit? Well, OK, the lawyer part. Well, we did name names in seasons one and two. Um, mm -hmm. We're not really doing that. We keep it general with the news stories because this was me naming names. So we're. With the news stories in season three, we're very general about it. But we did name names. We hired a defamation attorney. I mean, it, the scripts went through multiple rounds of review because I knew I was going against one of the most powerful theaters in the country. I wasn't naive. So I wanted to protect myself. I wanted to protect my husband. I wanted to protect our life. So because of that, it had to be meticulous. And you would want any podcast to be meticulous and truthful. But I had that extra pressure because there was always that threat because, you know, some not so great things happened to me. So, mm. you know, there was always that looming threat of if they were going to come after me and it didn't happen because it was truthful. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when we tell the truth, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And it's also amazing the fear that's always looming over us to tell the truth. Right. Mm. Because particularly in the arts, you know, it's ingrained in us to keep quiet, to not tell the truth. We're never going to work again. Some of our listeners were actively in this new season bullied and intimidated from telling the truth. So, yeah, and I'm a I'm a big believer that the truth does set you free, Martin. You know, I I developed a severe panic disorder because of what happened to me at this theater, and it was the power of telling my story and just so grateful to the listeners that listened to it and received it. But that cathartic act of telling my story and claiming it, our catchphrase is claim your story at stage combat mm -hmm. applies to everyone. You know, my doctor said, you know, I haven't had panic attacks since then, you know, and it, there was, it was a tremendous healing factor in my own recovery in my health and my mental health. Mm, it's so powerful for our mental health to, to speak our truth, isn't it? It's so, yeah. It, yeah, it's so empowering that it, it, when I've done it, I, I feel like I've become, it is a feeling of becoming free of everything that was weighing you down just goes yeah. instantly. Because yeah. there's, there's something in your, without getting too spiritual, there's something in your soul that knows it's not right to hold on to this. Yeah. And, you know, even in these little, our Instagram series, Dear Stage Combat, these are only a minute long, but, you know, the followers who, who connected with us and we featured them, it's meant a lot to them to just make a statement of, you know, I was mistreated by a theater program instructor, or I had a producer tell me never talk about your mental health or you never work again. You know, hmm. that's very cathartic to be able to say when perhaps you've never said it to anyone before. It's saying that what happened happened and I'm claiming that story. Even in a minute form, there's tremendous, tremendous power in that. Yeah, and you, you've really touched on something here that this industry is, it can be quite poisonous and it can be quite damaging to people's mental health. And it is a, a place where you are told, like you just said, if you speak up, that's the end of your career. Yeah. If you, yeah. Look, after, if you look after yourself, that's the, the, all your hopes and dreams are gone. Yeah. I mean, I spoke up in my job and, you know, I think we can give it away where it headed. You know, they fired me over the phone, <laughs> you know? So there were repercussions for me speaking up to say, I don't feel safe and you need to do something about it. Mm. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And what we want to try to do at stage combat is not only just bring awareness to what's wrong with the industry, but to say, Hey, everyone, there's a better way to do this. Like, it doesn't have to be this way just because it's been done this way for decades or, you know, your instructor had to deal with abuse, you know, continuing abuse because it's always been that way is not a reason to continue the abuse, particularly when we know there are better ways that will not harm people, that will not destroy people, and that we can all flourish as artists 
and better environments. That's what we're all about. Mm. Yeah, th- yeah, I can only just say it again. This is this is so important what you're doing that that you're you're raising the voices of these people that you're helping them and giving them an opportunity to to say their truth and to speak up. And even in your even in you sharing your truth is so empowering to others as well, because it shows people that they're not alone when they have these problems. Yeah, Martin. And that, you know, I didn't know. Look, I I come from the epitome of privilege. I'm a white male who's also a lawyer. So, I mean, I remember telling my husband, I don't think anyone's going to care about this story. And so, you know, I was really glad to see that, you know, artists from every walks of life and diversity identified with something, you know, and I think that what my personal story was, if this happened to the white guy who's a lawyer, right, who has a certain skill set, right, mm. who, who can speak up for himself, then what's happening to other people who are so afraid to voice or it's been implicitly and explicitly told to them that, you know, don't speak up. And so I was really glad to see that the podcast did resonate with so many people and even more thrilled that now we're actually bringing those voices forward in the new season. Mm. So where did this start for you? Where did doing, putting the issues that you had, the troubles that you went through, where did you go, I'm going to put this now into a podcast, I'm going to now put this out into the world in this format? You know, it's weird. I, I, I remember saying to my husband, it was like, you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month here in the U.S. And I believe I was saying like, you know, I think I'm just going to do some Facebook posts about some of the things that happened to me and saying that's not OK and speaking up about mental health. And then I don't know, from there, it just became what if this was a podcast? And then um it was actually suggested, we actually dramatized this in the finale episode of season two. My husband had a friend who works in media and he told him what happened to me. And the guy says, that sounds like a podcast. And you hear me in that episode laugh and says, that's ridiculous. Who would want to hear what I have to say? Mm. And then the more, I just started writing. And then as I started writing, um, it just kind of took over. And then it became more elaborate. And then there were voice actors. Then there was sound production. And I don't know. I think there's a certain naivety is a good thing. You don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> and I just dove right in. I mean, I seriously, I, I, I took the hardest, most difficult podcast format to do, which is serialized nonfiction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and did it. Yeah. And what's that done for you? What's that done for, like I say, this, this troubled time in, that you've had? Yeah. What's that? How's that helped with that time? Well, as I said, my doctor and I did not think I would have such a jump in my recovery for having a, a severe panic disorder, which means you have a higher propensity to go into panic attacks, you know. Mm. And as we got around towards that you know, that second season being done, we started noticing the panic was going away. And it was, it was realizing after so many false narratives put out by an employer to, it's all on the podcast, you know, try to get rid of somebody. Mm -hmm. It was saying, having a record with evidence, you know, we're very meticulous in the podcast because we tell it like a true crime podcast. Mm -hmm. It was like, no, no, this is what happened. Here's the evidence. And you can't take that away from me, you know? See, I, I even still get emotional thinking about that. And it is when our narrative has been denied, when you claim your story again, that's tremendously healing. You know, mm. did I think I would become out of that a mental health advocate or telling other stories to people? I had no, that was not on my radar, you know, and it just happened. And it's, you know, something I've been, you know, thrilled to take on. But I never dreamed, I didn't think there would be a season three. I thought I would tell the good speed story and that would be it. Mm. And I'm and I'm thrilled that it's um, it's become Sage Combat has become, you know, a center for advocacy and for other people to tell their stories. Tell me a little bit about why you feel so 
so passionate about this in the way that you do like you you just as you started to reflect there i could see the emotion i could see it touching you yeah so tell me a little bit about that why it means so much well because look all of us in the arts we all know this you know there's more of us the talent the actors than there are of them up here but they have all the power up here the power dynamic is completely askewed mm -hmm. we know what goes on we see how people are treated. We know how we've been treated. And we just try to hold it in just to get through it because we don't want to rock the boat. You know, in my case, it was so bad I had to say something. And it was so bad that I collapsed on stage during a performance and was sobbing in the wings. So when you hit that kind of rock bottom, Martin, you know, You have to find a way to get back up, you know, and I keep coming back to it. I don't want this person to be the next Sean. I don't want another Sean to have happened. What happened to me at the Goodspeed Opera House where I was working or any other theater, you know. And look, the more we can give visibility to these type of stories, my hope is eventually employers will start to think, hey, Remember that story? Maybe we don't want to be in a podcast, <laughs> you know, or maybe we don't want to be on someone's social media. You know, I, I there's a an actor here in the U.S. that just had to leave a prominent theater because of a toxic work environment. And she went on her Instagram and, and said, why? That's really important. Because mm. at the heart of it, Martin, I believe the only thing that theaters in particular respond to is public pressure. Is, 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 it is an endangerment to their donors, to their subscription bases, to their audiences. So we need to get audiences and donors to care more about this. And they're only going to care about it when we, the actors, are telling them, hey, that show you're enjoying, this is what's really going on backstage. Now, how do you feel about what you just paid that enormous, enormous price for your ticket? Mm. Feel good about that? And the audiences do care. They, they do they care. Yeah. They do care. They do. Yeah. They're they're interested in in what's going on with the with the actors and the performers in their lives, and yeah, you know that, that's why they that's why they look into all these behind the scenes type of stuff, and exactly. why they care about celebrity. And it's it's in our human nature to to care. It is part. Of, it is part of us, yeah. and and we're not going to want entertainment that's been given to us through through sacrifice that that isn't necessarily good. Yeah, it, it's the same thought of, do you want to support companies that are more environmentally conscious, okay? Do you want to support performing performance organizations that have toxic work environments, that abuse their workers, you know? And I think the really encouraging thing, Martin, is when we hear from people who listen to the podcast who don't work in the arts, but they say, look, I've always gone to theater, but now when I sit in the audience, I think about it in a different way. When I see a stage combat sequence on stage, I'm, I'm thinking about the safety of the actors. When I see a prop that breaks, I'm worried about their safety. When I'm watching Aladdin and I'm seeing them up on a magic carpet, I'm worried about their safety. And they should be thinking about those things. Mm. Yeah. So here's, a, here's an interesting question for you that, that, I, that I wonder about myself. Is this phrase, the show must go on? Yeah, we don't like that. Now, now <laughs> think, I've been in theatre most of my life. And personally, I have found some good from it. Yeah. Because I've found for me that theatre has been a safe place for me. Yeah. And it has been a place that if I have had trouble in my life, that difficult things going on, I have thrown myself into to my art and I have found comfort and escapism yeah and so I am able to to put aside the negativity in the real world for a moment and concentrate on the art now I know some people can't do that and that doesn't work for everyone hence why some people don't don't like that phrase the show yeah. must go on yeah. how, how, do, how do you feel about it how does it that kind of sit with you well that phrase originated uh, with circuses in the 19th century when it came to circus animals. So we're still using a phrase 
Mm -hmm. that referred to keeping the show going on when something went wrong with a circus animal, which we don't even, it's not even a cool thing to have circus animals anymore, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so that could, that tells you everything right there. Mm -hmm. The problem with that phrase, Martin, is the show must go on. The show is prioritized over the human capital, the humans who are on stage. By virtue of doing that, you have dehumanized the artists who are on stage. The show doesn't always have to go on. Mm. There are times when a show should be stopped, when the actors are in danger, when there's not enough people because of COVID to keep the show running and you're asking cast members, less cast members to move things on, you know, move the set. You know, cast members were always moving the set down these days. So I think that phrase has to go. Now, the idea of it being from a personal pushing through, see, that even has its own negative connotations. We used to celebrate people being sick, running off into the wings, throwing up in a bucket and going back on stage. No, <laughs> you're sick. <laughs> it's put the understudy on. You know, mm. I don't think that kind of, um, you know, damaging ourselves should be celebrated. Mm. There, Yeah, I guess there is an element of, you know, pushing yourself through with something and not dealing like myself, not dealing with the outside world. Burying your head in the sand isn't yeah. good for you. It isn't personally good, yeah. is it? It might, might help in the moment. But yeah. in the long run, you do have to go back to them things. So I guess it's a, a thing of finding balance between the two. Exactly. Escapism within your art, but still yeah. deal with the outside world. Or just make sure that, look, you can find escapism in your art, but you're entitled as a human being to be able to have that art in a safe environment, in a supportive mm -hmm. environment, and one where you're not working under unsafe or abusive circumstances. That's not a big ask. It's the same thing we ask for in corporate America. Why is it different in the arts? And the reason for that, Martin, is that we've always been told we're lucky to have these jobs. You're lucky to have these jobs. At the end of the day, they are jobs. We are human beings with full human, you know, human rights, with workers' rights. And so arts organizations, they need to get on board with where corporate America Corporations in the UK, I hope, are right now, because what I see is corporate America, at least over here, seems to be making some pretty big jumps when it comes to mental health, work safety. As a result of the pandemic, our theaters haven't made that jump. They're still operating a little bit pre-pandemic. Pre Talk to me. So I'm also a producer yeah. of theater as well. And I like to think of myself that is all someone that's always learning. I, I've made mistakes on how I've dealt with things over the years. I know that for sure. Um, but I want to make less mistakes and I, and I want to treat people right. Um, but I'm thinking back to a scenario that I had a few years ago when I was producing a, a small theatre show. And I had a member of the cast struggling with mental health. And they couldn't, I'd given them the part, but they couldn't turn up to rehearsals. And they were avoiding the situation, the problem. And with theatre, there is a thing that's going to happen at a certain time. People are going to be buying tickets. That is part of my income. It's part of me being able to pay them. And at that time, I had to say to the person, I don't think this is for you. Doing theatre, if you can't give me that commitment and be there for the show, there's only there's only a handful of people in this production. I can't move forward with my business if you're not here. Yeah. So I had to just let that person go. Now, I'm still questioning whether that was the right thing to do because I care about that person. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult, isn't it, to, to juggle from the from like a producer's side. How are we going to make this moving train keep moving forward to the point of the business happening yeah. and look after people? Yeah. 
Well, look, I think there's a difference in situations where, you know, just as if someone had a, you know, a physical injury and they couldn't show up to work. And I think in that particular situation, just, and this is just my own personal opinion, you know, I think all you can do is say, how are you doing? Is there anything we can do to, to help you? You know, what kind of support do you need? Do you have the support you need right now? And if this maybe isn't the best time for you to do a show, you know, maybe we could have you back in another show and to show the support because there is a problem if you can't physically bring yourself into work, right? Mm -hmm. Let's contrast that with a situation, you know, my situation was there were unsafe work conditions and it resulted in me having a panic attack because I felt so unsafe. So that's a situation where there was something the employer could have done. The employer could have done something about the situation. But also my employer refused to acknowledge that I was even having panic attacks, that I was even dizzy. There was like a, a code of silence. So that's, that's not good, right? Mm. And so I think what we have to do across the board is our employers need mental health literacy, right? How do we talk about it? How do we recognize when there is a mental health issue? And how can we provide support? Um, one of the things we have been advocating for at Stage Combat is as part of the production team having what we call in the US a mental health coordinator, which is a mental health professional that could be there. And again, this is a different situation from the situation you were dealing with, Mark. But for instance, if an actor is doing really heavy emotional work, you know, and we've seen actors, you know, it, it gets to you. So perhaps that actor needs some tools, some tools mm -hmm. on how to safely enroll into that role and to roll out of that role. It was something I had to do in Billy Elliot in the story we saw um, in stage combat, you know, but they can also be there for crisis management. You know, we hear a lot of, um, you know, some of the stories we have coming up in season three was involved, you know, self-harm. And so a mental health coordinator would have been another member of the team that can navigate that person to the care that they needed. So, you know, it's just part of the whole landscape of how we have to change things versus the landscape before all of this, Martin, is we don't even talk about mental health. We don't even say the words mental health. I never heard mental health mentioned once mm -hmm. on my job. How is that possible when we are actors expected to emote, to show emotions, you know, to tell these stories on stage? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, I I also discovered so like I say I, I I I hear what you're saying there, and I feel that what I could have done differently was find a better way to communicate with this person rather than just think about the business. I could have asked more questions and look to find a way to try and make it move forward rather than just say this needs to end here. For that person because maybe it didn't yeah maybe I mean, maybe maybe a com maybe a bigger conversation of support may have been a we may have been able to continue the show successfully with that person well look i know there was a period of time after what i went through there's no way i could have gone and and auditioned and done a show you know i wasn't i wasn't emotionally healthy enough you know and so I think that is a different situation than when there is a crisis that happens on the job that mm. is a result of the role or the result of, um, I'd say, practices. But it also could be a matter of I have a history of panic attacks and I may need to have a break if, if I feel one coming on, you know, something like that. So I, I think you are right, Martin. I think just having a conversation. But again, I'm not really sure just a little what I'm hearing in my own opinion. Perhaps it just wasn't the right time for that particular person yes. to to take on a role, you know. Mm -hmm. And that and that was my belief at the at the time. Yeah. But then moving on from that and moving into my next production, I started to discover the importance of building a community, built rather than just building a show. Yeah. And I've started to bring that to everything I work on now. Because yeah. I find that if the people can come together as a collective, the production itself, the value the production gives is so much greater and higher. 
Absolutely. And just look, the odds are that most of your cast is dealing with some sort of mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Just statistically, people are. But even more so, there's statistics of people who work in the arts. So even just, you know, building community, saying, here's, a you know, I would love to hear this on day one. We want to make sure that your work, you're doing it in an emotionally and physically safe manner, right? Here's resources if you need to reach out to someone. If you're working out of town, here's a list of therapists if you need to talk to someone. Um, you know, here's a contact of someone we can put you in touch with if you're having a problem. Is there a liaison, you know, that could possibly be an ear to talk to, you know? I think what you and I have had, always had the history of is that we don't talk about it. No. You just show up, don't say a word, don't be a problem, and that denies us our humanity. That's just not human, right? No. <laughs> Tell me a little not. bit more about the, the the safe space, The when you create a safe environment. What does that actually look and feel like as a cast member? Well, look, I think, you know, um, I think this is where intimacy directors can also be very key, even if you don't have a mental health coordinator. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the acknowledgement that, you know, it is okay to talk about your mental health. You know, if you walk into a, look, I felt like, I felt like I had horns growing out of my head because I was having panic attacks at that theater. And that's what I was made to feel like. But that there wasn't even a discussion on day one. We got a Me Too talk, <laughs> right? <laughs> we heard about how important diversity was, even though it was a very poor cast. So didn't really get that. We didn't hear a word about mental health. So mm. that already tells me, oh, don't bring that up. That's not safe to bring up. If I bring that up, that would be a liability. You know? And I think just having that conversation because we're already having conversations. How do we have a safe space when it comes to Me Too, the sexual harassment, right? So that's important, but we seem to be missing something on the mental health end. What more can be done at this point now then? Well, just start acknowledging is the first thing, right? <laughs> like just acknowledge it on day one. As a theater say, we care not only about your physical safety, we care about your emotional safety. So if you need resources, here are resources. Perhaps we have hired a mental health coordinator as part of the production. Because you know what? We're doing a show that's got some really tough emotional work. We're doing Angels in America, you know? So we want you to be able to lay us on with this person. If you're having either a crisis, but particularly you're having trouble. I'm having trouble getting into Joe's scene in this without damaging myself because, you know, most people, let's face it, they're not taught these tools on how to safely go in and out of these roles. Hmm. So I think that would be a big part of it. Yeah. Was you always a compassionate person, Sean? Was you always, this, <laughs> was you always this, have you always been this understanding or do you get this from a place of having lived it, having experienced it? Well, I said this, I've said this in interviews before. I, I, I want to think that I was, okay? <laughs> but I think I was very much a sort of alpha take charge kind of guy. And then I think this experience kind of made me realize no matter who we are, we're all vulnerable to something. So even with my law clients, I always thought of myself as being an empathetic lawyer. You know, I'm a nice lawyer, but I can also be very tough when I need to be. But now I do see what my clients are going through in a different way. You know, I do a lot of real estate law. Hmm. Okay. Buying a piece of property, your house is like the biggest transaction in your life. It's very emotional. It's very um, anxiety inducing. And now I see that through their eyes, you know, versus I think a, lawyer, a lot of lawyers are like, you know, here's the contract, da, 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 you know, I, or when they lose a property, you know, so another buyer comes in, you want to be able to say, you know, I know this feels really bad because <laughs> you were, you already moved in. But I always feel these things work out for the best, you know. And then, you know, I, I, I do trust in estates. And sometimes a partner has died. And that really, my empathy skills really come into play. So, Martin, I, I think, you know, I didn't like going through this when I went through it. 
I'd like to think it's made me a better person. I'd like to think it's made me a more empathetic person. Um, I think it would be hard to go through that and not be. Mm. Well, let me take that back. I mean, I guess the other way you could just get really bitter about it all, right? And just go inward, <laughs> right? And, yeah. what, and what good would that do? Well, it's it wouldn't do any good, right? But they, it's one route versus can I try to overcome this and can I make something good come out of this, right? Yeah. How do you think that empathy serves you? How do you do you think that that empathy does good for you as well as it's doing for them? Oh yeah. I mean, look, my relationship with my husband is better. You know, but here's the thing. I I always as an actor, if you don't have empathy, what do, what, what do you know? What do you have? I mean, that's yeah. why I'm amazed, you know, mm -hmm. and we hear the story of stage combat. There seemed to be a few people with no empathy. Mm. So, but, you know, I always had that ability to identify the lives of my characters, you know, to, you know, people would say like, oh, Sean, you're the type of, you know, you seem the actor really goes deep and thinking, well, no, that's just acting. That's good. That's living the experience of your character. You know, not method acting, which is harmful. But so I always had that ability. Um, I think this experience has allowed me to look at my outside relationships in a different way. You know, mm -hmm. because don't you agree? It's very easy as an artist just to be, you know, very. You can get a little self-centered. <laughs> you can get a little driven. Yeah, you know? I, I guess there's a there's ego to watch in amongst all of this. There's ego, and then there's that people telling you if you're not tough enough, you're not going to make it. So what does that mean? You have to harden yourself. How mm. do you do that and still have, you know, empathy for your That's characters? Cool. So I hope that I'm a, a kinder person now. You know, mm -hmm. um, I mean that's all I can hope for, but it's something that I now try to really practice every day. Yeah, and it and it, and it is tough, isn't it, when um, when you're pursuing a, a creative life. And you do yeah. get negative outside influences coming in that you you defend yourself against. Yeah. But then try and keep that soft exterior of having, yeah. you know, of not becoming like that negativity that gets thrown your way well, is a challenge. Yeah. I mean, look, and <laughs> I talked about this in the podcast. I saw people of a certain age that had lost their joy for the craft of acting. And I remember mm. thinking, I don't want to ever become like that. Now, this experience of what I went through after that could have had that effect. <laughs> you know, it's like it could have been like, I don't want to, I, you know, and it did for a while. I couldn't go into a theater for a couple of years because I would get panic attacks. And that's a mm. little inconvenient, you know, so it could have had that effect. And I think that's always the danger when we face a crisis, right? What are we ultimately going to do with it? You know, and it's tough. You know. Mm. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm thinking back at a moment where I said I'm. I don't want to do acting anymore. Did you feel and that it, way at one point? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was. Um, yeah, it was a while ago now. But there was a moment where I went. I don't. I don't enjoy this anymore. Mm. Because of the people. Yeah. Because the people <laughs> around me are not being very nice yeah and and so like i i just assumed the whole industry was like that at that point yeah like yeah. And just some kind of assumption that came over me that went oh like if i go into the next thing that's going to be exactly the same yeah so i'm not going to look for a different group of people yeah because they're going to be just as mean and nasty as the last group and yeah. there was a good few years where i was just like I'm, I, I don't know what to like. I don't know what to do because I don't yeah. do this. You know what helped me, Martin? It was going back to my old acting class after the Good Speed events. And it took me a few years. Didn't go back until after the podcast came out. Um, and I thought, okay, I'll know <laughs> if I still have the passion and the want for the craft of acting. If I go back to class, and that first day back was such an emotional experience because I sat there and now there was none of the garbage that we do, right? 
there were no chats. If you listen to the podcast, you know who Chad is. There, there, there were no auditions with people screaming wicked behind the doors, you know, piercing your eardrums. You know, it was just 12 people in a room, sitting in chairs, admiring the craft of people just sitting up in front of a room a few feet from you and doing amazing work where it wasn't about getting right. It was just being truthful, you know? Taking it back to basics. Taking it back to basics. And I think that would be like my, I just, we, we have a Patreon series called Just Acting coming out also with a mainstream podcast. And we were talking about this today is if you can just find that safe space where you can take it back to basics and remind yourself what made you as a 21 year old guy say, there's nothing more I want to be than to be an actor. If you can find that later in your life, God, that's just gold, right? It's so amazing and a, and a gift, you know. Oh, yeah, because it because it was at that point when you first discovered it, wasn't it? it yeah, it was it like always. I I never yeah. knew anything else. Yeah, you know? once once I discovered this, this was there was nothing different. When yeah. I was sixteen, when I discovered theatre, and and before that. I was going to join the RAF and I was going to you? Join, yeah like that was you know as a as a as a you know a teenager yeah. that was my my goal set um I thought I was going to join the army or something um yeah. I didn't realize that idea was based upon me playing I enjoyed playing as soldiers <laughs> I didn't actually <laughs> like the idea of going out there and you know shooting anyone I just liked right. the idea of playing Mm -hmm. um and i'd always i didn't realize i'd done that my entire life i was i was someone that just played <laughs> mm. um and then the moment that i discovered theater my life changed in an instant yeah it, it was a it was an awakening it was a, a moment of wow i found who i am yeah and then the trick is martin then once we rediscover that joy Mm. then hopefully we have better tools when we go back out there that we're not going to let people, work environments harm us. Mm. You know, there may be some jobs that you just need to leave. That was the actor I was telling you about earlier. She made the decision to, she needed to walk out of that show or yeah. you will stand up for yourself or Maybe you now have a therapist that you can call when there are problems and you can get some advice so you're not doing it all alone. So mm. the, the, the balancing act, right? It's always the balancing act. Can, can we do both? I believe we can. I think we just need more tools because it's not so great out there sometimes. You know? But if you start with knowing who you are and what you love, you know the value of the loss of that, right? Yeah. So maybe we'll be more, you know, um, we'll put a more, little more effort in our tools and protecting ourselves in the workplace. And you've touched on something there that's really important, knowing who you are. Yeah. Knowing who you are as an artist gives you so much power. Yeah. Personally gives you power. Doesn't, you know, it yes. gives you, yeah. it, 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 knowing who you are is something you have to, discover separate to the art absolutely and at that point when i had my bad theater experience i didn't know who i was at that time it, to be able to speak up to be mm -hmm. able to to walk away a walk away if that yeah. same situation happened to me today i would just say bye yeah i'm done yeah i didn't know who i was at that time how did you get to that point that you knew who you were Can, I think I had to go through a lot more shit. I yeah. had to, I had to experience a lot more dark days, yeah. and I had to experience life. I had been so consumed with the whole acting journey and the whole mm -hmm. "I'm going to be successful as an actor," and I, I must be in every play I can get get the opportunity any work that comes my way I'm going to take it mm. and 
yes, I had a life going on. I had a, I had a family, I had young children. Um, but I wasn't concentrating on taking a moment to consider myself in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And yeah. And then I had some, some dark times and, um, some bad things outside in life happened. But when I found a conclusion to, to those bad things, then, yeah, then I started to find myself. I, I'm so glad to hear you say that because that has come up in many of the stories coming out this next season. And I think you hit on two really great things. You know, the first thing is the value that we are more than just being actors. You know, when our identity gets too infused with being an actor, that any invalidation of that that identity is devastating. Mm. This is a common theme in several of the stories that, that you'll hear this season. And I think the other thing is the lived experience, because we have a lot of storytellers in the new season say, back then when that happened to me, I was terrified to stand up. Today, I would never stand for it. And I would speak out if I saw it happen to someone else. I would never let that happen again, you know? And it sounds like both of those things happen for you. Yeah, and I and I and I think that the I think we do have to experience the bad. Well, I've had yeah. to experience the bad to understand how to to live and move forward. And who you are, right? And discover who I am within yeah. that within those dark days. Yeah. I <laughs> I understand who I am much more than I did five years ago. And I thought I understood who I was. Mm. But to go through something like this, and particularly when you have someone put out a false narrative, it, it forces you to investigate your own life, your own life, not just the events that happen, to say, this is who I am. You don't get to say who I am. Mm. This is who I am. That's incredibly powerful. And, it, and, I, and I feel that it was powerful for me to, and this is partly why I'm doing this podcast series, because it was so powerful and important for me to hear that other people had discovered that as well yes other people had had those problems that we all that, that the majority of us do have these dark days but the majority of us do also come through them yeah to a better place yeah i mean i i agree with you i mean i'm sure what you have found doing your podcast is just the power of people realizing they're not alone right that's when it feels really dark you feel like you're all alone mm. and the power of community. You know, we've really been trying to build to even our, just our Instagram has become a, a little, you know, a community center for actors to, to vent or say what's important to them. So they feel like they're, they're not alone because we're, we're we always feel alone. We're pitted against each other. You know, we're auditions. We're, we're in auditions. We've got, you know, our track when we're just going out there and throwing it out there. So, yeah, I think that's really important. Mm. And yeah, and we're doing all the creative industries. Yeah, we're, we we are doing this alone. That yeah. when we can find an opportunity to to come together and and build a community, that we should we should take it. And yeah, and like I said in my in my last production that I did, I, that was one of my main focuses was to to build a community. And there How was a number. Of, well, there was a. It started day one. It started day one that day one wouldn't be about the show. Day mm. one was about the people. Getting who you to, are. Who yeah. you are. Getting yeah. to know each other. That's uh, like, that should not sound like a groundbreaking idea. No, it is it a shouldn't. groundbreaking idea. But it is. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. you're like thrown on day one, table read, da da da. It's just, I'm Sean. And then you're reading the character. And then you, yeah, you say your name. You say, <laughs> you know, and that's about it. And yeah. and then you get on with the you get on with the, yeah. the, the task at hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, for me, it was. Yeah. And yeah, it was making sure that that everyone knew who everyone was outside of the production. And, and how did you did you sense how people received that? Were they receptive to that? Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And I also brought in not just the cast from day one, but the crew. So that there so were important. so that there was yeah. a team 
that there was a family building so that there wasn't a you know the the cast rehearsed for 10 weeks and then all of a sudden we've got 20 outsiders jump yeah yeah join us. yeah no this this was a case of those 20 outsiders they were there from the start as well yeah. so there were there was no outsiders and if there was one or two outsiders that came in later on that they were welcomed with open arms because there was such a big community going on already yeah i love that you brought in the crew and you know we have a lot of people ask sean can you do some stories about the crew and we really want to do that at some point you know but you know the crew is going through a lot of the same things we're we're talking about they just, mm. just not having to do the emotional work on stage but you know it's a lot of the mistreatment that we talk about they're getting it too yeah. you know and you know i i, I you know, we just earmarked, if we can get to a fourth season, an episode called The Crew Is Not Okay, <laughs> you know, and, and and we need to talk about, I love that you brought them into that circle. Yeah, and and I, and I take that from a place of of empathy as well, because I I started to see myself as not just an actor, but I've, I've pushed myself into all areas of theatre, so stage mm -hmm. managing, directing, lighting, sound, and it is a hard job coming in for that last that last moment, that last week of rehearsals and straight into the live production. That yeah. is a really tough time for the crew. And, and working like enormous amount of hours, hours mm -hmm. inhumane hours. That's yes, awesome. sometimes, yes. right? Let's be honest, which makes you more susceptible to accidents, you know, mental health strain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I think back to that last production, and I remember w working with my my lighting and sound guy. We worked through the night for three nights in a row. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and that's not that's not necessarily safe and something that we should do. Yeah. But but in the in the theatre world, sometimes it has to happen like that, and so we need to look after those people where we can. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I think there is a whole discussion, sort of, you know. You have 10 out of 12s in the UK. Do you know that phrase? No, no. It's like in tech, they can work you 10 out of 12 hours. Oh, okay. Right yeah, before right. you open. And so, mm -hmm. and then for the crew, it's even longer, right? Because they're mm -hmm. before, they're in after. So, you know, there is a movement to try to abolish that and just kind of say to theaters, well, look, I know you're all struggling, but you need to budget into your time, humane working hours so that everyone is not, you know, so exhausted you know you inevitably as a singer will get sick because your immune system's worn down but it also you know creates you know physical safety issues possibly you know this happens to me so often that i fall ill after a show yeah. because i push them extremes yeah because i haven't considered my own health because of my i've been i've been sacrificing it for my craft for my art yeah. Well, yeah, we, we talk about this in one of the early episodes with the somatic psychologist. So what happens is, at least it's to me, is when we are in these prolonged periods of stress, the body secretes something called cortisol, and that chemical lowers your immune system. And so if you notice how many times do we get to opening night and then the body crashes, we've got a sore throat the next morning or full-blown sinus infection. Yeah, that's what happens. Yeah. I, I won't lie though, I do kind of enjoy it. <laughs> do you? <laughs> but that's on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I do. I do kind of I do kind of like that intense work. The adrenaline rush, right? The adrenaline, yeah. Mm. I definitely get something from it. Mm. I definitely get something from throwing myself into something for a period of time, like working really, really hard. And I get a fulfillment from seeing that into fruition mm. but i know i've got to change that it, it, just because i enjoy it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for me yeah it's definitely not good for you yeah no yeah coming up with so many realizations today sean this, is, this has been this has well, been look, <laughs> it, yeah it's just, it's just a conversation you know yeah. and it's kind of like we have to change the way all of us all of us view and talk about the industry you know and i always just come back to try to think in terms of how would a worker in a non-arts job be treated now there's 
there's industries where people are not treated well. Let's think about the ones where they are treated well. And then how can we apply that to the arts, you know, where there's not these crazy hours or these abusive circumstances? Not saying your your productions were abusive in any way, but just saying across the board, you know. So as we as we wrap this up, Sean, I'm thinking about the future. If you could go into the future 10 years from now, how would you like it to look? What would you like the industry to look? What would be the ideal scenario? Yeah, I'll start with the most concrete idea is that all productions would have some sort of mental health component in the production team. And we know this is possible because we saw in the reaction to Me Too that intimacy directors became more common. I spent 25 years playing romantic leads, never had an intimacy director, was always told by the director, go make out with someone, which is mm -hmm. sick. It's bonkers when you think about that. I hope in 10 years people will say, how is it we went so long asking actors to pour their hearts out, to cry tears, and we never had a mental health component on the production team. That's what I hope to see. And once we have that, along with mental health literacy, we are taking care of people. We are not burning out artists. People will leave the industry because they want to, not because they have no other choice, because they've been burned out or they've been, you know, destroyed by other people. You know, that the conversation of mental health will be as common as you talking about getting a sinus infection the next day, you know? That's what, what, I, what I want to see. And I'm hopeful we'll get there because I am convinced that the younger generation of artists who do talk more openly about their mental health, I'm convinced that they're not going to put up with the status quo. That's mm -hmm. what gives me hope. People my age and older, a lot of them, we can't change them. They're going to think, I suffered, then you have to. I refuse to accept the fact that because I've suffered in the industry, that people coming after me have to suffer. There's a better way, and it starts with mental health being part of the conversation every day. And that conversation is so important, isn't it, that we just keep talking to each other. Yeah. Just, through talking, we just keep figuring this out. Yeah, absolutely. And you heard in stage combat when it wasn't even acknowledged, what would have been the power of just acknowledging, mm. you know, for me personally, Sean, yeah. we get that you're having a mental health issue. What can we do to support you instead of turning your, their backs literally and ignoring what, what was happening? Think about the opposite of that, that we talk about that from day one. And now mm. we're not all living in a culture. And what about you, Sean? What are your hopes for the future? What are your dreams for you personally? What does that look like? Well, I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I mean, podcasting, I never dreamed I could do a podcast. I'm very excited about this new season. And we also created four new series on Patreon um, to go along with the mainstream podcast. We created an acting podcast. Uh, director's commentary on the Good Food story that you listen to, a mental health podcast, and a social media commentary podcast. So lots of fun stuff there. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to keep doing that. In performance, I don't know where I live in that world. I'm still going to my acting class. I love it. I was just working on Tony Kushner last week. <laughs> Some of the <laughs> hardest stuff I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Wonderful experience. I don't know if I'll go back to musical theater. Maybe if I do go back it will be straight theater i did do one show last fall you know post good speed uh which was great so i'm just taking it one day at a time and i'm just going to try to do everything i can to try and make life better i mean i know that sounds corny that's fine that's but, that's, a, that's a nice message that's a nice a I nice mean, feeling and a you know, what, what's so bad about saying things that are corny? Maybe we should normalize that. <laughs> I mean, things. if we could all think of it in terms of what little thing can I contribute to the world? I know what I can do right now is to try to get performing artists voice and to talk about mental health. And I'm happy doing that. Mm. Well, it's wonderful that you are, Sean, and I, I really do truly appreciate it. 
and um, I think you're doing a wonderful thing with your with your podcast and your social media. It's a really important message. Um, yeah, and the yeah. appreciate that from from an actor, from also as a producer and director of theatre. I think it's a really important listen your podcast. So well, it's same to you, Martin. I mean, you're asking and 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 posing all the questions and thoughts that everyone should be doing right now. So, I mean, I see you mentally doing the work, you know, so I applaud you for that. Much appreciation, Sean. Thank you for joining me today. My and if, if anyone has been watching or listening to this conversation, then uh, we appreciate you as well. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again. Thank you.